All right. Um, so yeah, I, I think this is a, a great topic because I think that um, you know, as we as spine surgeons uh, often have to resort to fusion. Obviously, um, you know, limitations of uh, decompression. We can only get so much. We do have to do fusion, and uh, patients are often very averse to that concept. So, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know uh, the mechanical limitations. Um, you know, we are taking away motion from the spine when we do a fusion, and especially in deformity, there we don't really have any other tools to treat deformity except for fusion. Unfortunately, um, we'll talk a little bit about the literature because um, again, sometimes this is uh, contra. Um, you know, con contrary to what you would imagine, and uh, some other things that there's not a lot of literature out there for, and uh, maybe things that we could look at moving forward. So as I mentioned before, patients sometimes are absolutely appalled when you tell them you're gonna fuse the spine. Um, you know, the idea of a fusion is um, something that is not how our spine was designed. And obviously, if we can avoid doing that, we want to. But as uh, surgeons that do deformity, we really have to. Um, but, you know, people may overestimate the amount of mobility that's present. So we only do fusions for pathology. Um, we're talking about flat back. Um, coronal deformity, uh, severe degenerative changes, uh, how much is that spine actually moving to begin with? A uh, question that I don't know we have a great answer to, but um, should be uh, investigated. Um, deformity surgery, um, often we have to do from the thoracic all the way to the pelvis, um, whether it's high or low, um, oftentimes that's required, and you know we have to put these instrumentations in rigidly in order to get fusion. So, um, what do you tell people when they when they have these questions? So, um, as I mentioned before, you know decompression in spine surgeons is is awesome, but not always possible. Um, and then you know, do the increasing level of fusions create more stiffness? You know, when do you want to try to save a patient a level of fusion? Is that really going to give them more motion? Um, and in terms of their post-operative functional status, you know, how is that going to change? Um, so this was a, a retrospective cohort looking at. Um, decompression and multiple levels of fusion. So not really deformity surgery, but uh, one and two level decompressions and then looking at up to four levels of fusion. Um, and you can see here that with the increasing severity, so on the left is uh, no levels fused, on the right is one. Um, don't see, and these are all the different um, kind of questions that were asked. And you don't really see a huge difference with one level, but as you go increasing in terms of the amount of instrumentation you're putting in, uh, you do see more limitation in terms of people's functional ability. One of the things that this study did not look at was what was the functional ability beforehand. Um, and we'll kind of investigate that a little bit further. But the person needing a four-level fusion was probably more limited to begin with. So this isn't really comparing pre and post-op, just those people that are having these different types of procedures. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I did not know this study, but uh, one of Bob's famous studies from uh, several years back, looking at toileting and perineal care. Um, you know, patients with long fusions uh, do have, uh, may have preoperative limitations, but have been shown to have postoperative limitations as well. Um, so this is a fairly small study, but you know, 30 per six. 36% reported some post-operative difficulty, and it's something to keep in mind if you're doing a long fusion. Um, you know, the uh, the ability to care for oneself is something that you might want to talk to patients about. This is actually an interesting. Um, from that study, you know, this patient had significant limitation in their ability to, you know, do their perineal care. Um, they did have a non-union up at the top. After removing that hardware, they found that they were able to uh, regain that function. Um, so there was enough motion there for them to be less symptomatic. Um, and then again, how much is uh, preoperative limitation contributing? So, um, you know, flat back or scoliosis that definitely affects the motion um, of those segments. They're not moving normally to begin with. Um, and then there's a change in functionality when you do arthrodesis. So um, you know, this is looking at stiffness after um, a complete lumbar uh, fusion. So um, this is from the ISSG group once again, and 103 patients minimum two-year follow-up. Um, and then uh, we'll really focus on this uh, lumbar uh, stiffness disability index. Um, 
And so um, really focusing on these uh, changes in values. So uh, as we mentioned before, uh, people are limited ahead of time. Um, but the, the change in value looking at the LSDI, so ODIs, SR22, this is why we do surgery. You see the improvement in, in outcomes. That's why we do these surgeries. That's why our patients are happy. Um, but looking at the, the top line up there, um, so you do see that when you go to the upper thoracic spine, that's the left-handed column, you do lose a little bit of, um, of your, so that's an increase in stiffness um, with that elevated number. And that's not significantly significant or statistically significant. Um, but when you actually look at the th thoracolumbar spine, these patients were subjectively gaining function, feeling subjectively less stiff than they were before their surgery. So um, just goes to show that although you're definitely taking away motion from the spine, if we're taking away segments that are painful and non-functional, people may subjectively feel like they're actually gaining uh, mobility. Um, and then, you know, just some other things that have come up, um, you know, results from one core uh, relevant to another. Um, some of the questions in that um, LSDI score are really ge geared toward a Western audience. Um, and they've done some um, adjustments to that to really try to bring in some of the things that other cultures may experience. So there's a, a group from South Korea in 2016. They showed significant limitation in ADLs um, when you're uh, treating specifically flat back, which is very common in that culture. Um, and those fusions when you're asking people about other things here. And these are actually two versions of an adjustment of the LSDI. Um, but when you're looking at things like cutting your toenails, um, sitting in a cross-legged position, picking something up off the floor, those are much more specific. And those are the things that you may find that your patients with long fusions are limited in. So, you know, if for some reason that they, you know, have a specific lifestyle where they're gonna need to do those things. And I just, uh, you know, target these blue lines to the right side and, you know, not a big change when you look at two years, and I think that's another thing is patients aren't going to be doing especially well at the you know six month mark necessarily. They'll continue to improve, and you can see that sustained throughout the two years. But there is a significant limitation if you're talking about getting up off the floor, or trying to sit cross-legged. You know, long fusion will affect that. You know, cervical spine is something that um, is definitely less studied. Um, you know. People are usually more concerned about what they're able to see, how they're able to function moving around space, um, less concerned with how they're able to kind of twist their neck or bend in a lateral bending, which we do take away with fusion. Um, but you know, these are things that we should probably be, probably be looking into. Um, you know, one of the studies here um, wasn't. Uh, looking specifically at deformity, but looking at cervical fusion, um, mean level was three. I would think it was up to seven was the max in the study, looking at both anterior, posterior, and 360 fusions. Um, and then kind of a busy slide here, but you know, just to focus on that box in the lower right corner, um, you know, when you're looking at fusions, the amount of extension that you're um, losing is um, actually in a three level is, is just a couple of degrees. But patients are actually gaining extension in this study from a, you know, this is using a goniometer, you know, pretty rigorous objective measurement. So in lateral bending and extension, in short level cervical fusions, they're actually gaining motion. And I think that just plays into the fact that you can let patients know that when you, even if we're fusing your spine, if we're fusing an arthritic painful segment, people feel like they're, they're moving better and they're more comfortable, so subjectively they're, they're doing better. And that's kind of represented on that left-handed panel as well. Not statistically significant, but in terms of the um, actual limitation in the range of motion, so um, that drop in the score shows that people feel that they're able to move better. So may not be um, something that's, that's, uh, that you would imagine to have happen, but people do seem to feel better. 
Um, you know, other things looking forward, um, you know, the CSRS just came out. Um, one of our other former fellows, Andrew Jack, um, with the cervical stiffness disability index that just came out a couple months ago. So a new tool that we may be able to evaluate the cervical spine with, I think. Um, you know, there's a lot of things out there that we don't really know yet. And uh, we all kind of know that occipital cervical fusion is very limiting for patients. And, you know, usually we're doing that in cases where uh, people are in danger of losing their ability to walk in general. So stiffness is maybe not the biggest issue, but uh, it's something that we haven't really well um, described yet. So things to look forward to. So thank you guys. I uh, just wanted to see if you had any questions, and uh, thank you for letting me tear apart. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for presenting that. I, um, you know, I, I've gotten a lot of ribbing over the years for uh, my advocacy <laughs> of the LSDI and the, uh, now the CSDI, but I, I do think they've been useful in my own practice and certainly in, in uh, my ability to inform patients what they can expect, and I, I have to say, uh, our, we did some preliminary data as a single center at OHSU that did find that there was an increase in stiffness after a pan lumbar fusion. I was really surprised that our data from ISSG did not show that. I think the ISSG data is better. It's better quality data and multi-center and all of that and bigger numbers. And uh, so I, I think the bottom line is I understand it is short segment fusions, if anything, actually increase the perception of um, motion because pain becomes equivalent to mobility in some some way and but long segment fusions they're not compared to normal they are not normal they are they experience stiffness based limitations but they're changed from preoperatively it's not much is that about yeah and I think I think it's it's specific you know um, in your 70 year old you know in terms of their functional limitations they may not see it uh, but in a younger patient that's going to be expecting more of their um, you know their physical lifestyle then they they will definitely see some limitations so right. yeah yeah I assumed Eric you had a question or a well, I'd just comment. like to congratulate you Bob on all the work that you've done on stiffness in general um, and in this field particularly. I do think that, I, I think, uh, I all ribbing aside, I think you are onto something. I, I do think in, it really depends on the level, the proximal level. So I, in general, I find if I do a T10 to pelvis, people really, they say they, they have a more difficult time relaxing their low back and particularly sitting and standing, but they don't have a lot of functional limitations. If I go to T4, then uh, it, it's all like the arm length, to perineum ratio. And so, right, some people got big long arms and they can get to it no matter what you do. And some people got little T-Rex arms. And those people are pissed because they've got to take like a wiper helper in the bathroom with them everywhere they go. And it's in their purse. And in general, it is uh, the, uh, without getting too graphic, it is about the anatomical way that you wipe your bottom. And so men tend to have less problems than women just in terms of just getting to that right spot. Um, anyway, I don't, that's not much of a question, just a comment, I suppose. Uh, I think it's a valid, uh, and you know, there now are these assistive devices that didn't exist, uh, at least when we started all of this. Uh, um, but uh, it's, it's been an interesting evolution. And I think we talked about that as a study idea at one point, the arm to trunk ratio. We never have gotten around to doing that, but I think, I think you're right. <laughs> Yeah, Jason, yeah okay. I completely agree. I have the same discussion with patients. And, you know, it's interesting. We're about to hear about pediatric spine surgery. And we, I think it's important for us who treat adults that in the pediatric spine surgery population, usually the patient and the people who care most about the patient are in the room. Right. right. And so this disclosure discussion is very different than for our adult patients where they, the patient themselves may be the only one in the room. Um, and then, you know, to Doug's discussion earlier about cervical post-operative complications, it's often, you know, then family members coming out of the woodwork sort of like, whoa, whoa I didn't know about all this mm -hmm. type of thing. And, you know, at our institution, we've begun to videotape the, uh, the discussion with the patient, um, especially when dealing with deformity patients. What's that? I told you so. I told you so. Yeah, well, so we use a commercially available 
uh, thing that they can watch later. They can right. mail it to their family members. Oh. And I'm usually very specific about, I want you to go send this to your son or daughter who couldn't right. be here today right, right. so that they can watch this and then they can ask questions. Because I think that there's so much information that we are providing to patients and there's all this data about the fact that they do not remember what it is that we tell them. So I think that it's really critical when dealing with the adult patient. Yeah, I think that's a, that sounds like a great approach and I applaud that. That's a step beyond uh, kind of shared decision making, it sounds like. So. You know, uh, great talk, Amir, and thank you. The one thing, there's a small patient group that I think you, we should always think about and, and that's the, the, the po folks that are paraplegic. And if you're taking care of paraplegics, this is amplified a hundred times because the, everything that they do is coming from their waist to their thoracic spine, all their mobility, and there's so many functional things that they're doing utilizing that. And, and particularly in my patients that I see that are, you know, with a Charcot joint uh, below a thoracic fusion after a spinal cord injury. And when you extend them, which is frequently down to the pelvis, it's a big deal for them. And I really spend a lot of time with those folks talking to them about how, you know, they're gonna be stiffer and there's things that they're not going to be able to do which will impact their independence in a big way. And uh, I think that's an important conversation uh, with that specific group. Fortunately, it's not a lot of patients, but you only have to not tell one patient about it and when they come back, they're going to be really, really unhappy because they've lost some independence because of that uh, operation. I think that's a great point because some people feel like you can, you have more leeway with people that are paraplegic, and and the opposite can be true. Yeah. Talk. Thank Thanks. You guys. Thanks, Amir.